นะโมทัสสะภะคะวะโตอะระหะโตสัมมาสัมบุทัสสะนะโมทัสสะภะคะวะโตอะระหะโตสัมมาสัมบุทัสสะนะโมทัสสะภะคะวะโตอะระหะโตสัมมาสัมบุทัสสะปุถังธรรมังสังขังนมัสสัมิAnd uh, as those of you who were here last time, you'll remember that uh, he has a particular interest in religious form and the skillful use of form and custom tradition, and how that works. And so he has often been uh, quoting uh, the works of Krishnamurti, who is a, a, a very well-known spiritual teacher. Uh, and one who is particularly, um, say, uh, uh, taken a, a pathway trying to avoid traditional and customary forms, and so a lot of the, the questions and dialogue that um, that uh, arises between the two of them in, uh, involves uh, the uh, experience of Lumpur Sumedha with uh, Wat, uh, with Wat Bapong, with uh, Lumpur Cha's teaching, the Thai forest tradition, and uh, the skillful use of form. So uh, uh, where we finished last time, uh, Roger was just asking about uh, Lumpur Sumato and the quote young Bhikkhu Sume uh, Sujito, <laughs> who was with him. Uh, they, they had been going on arms round in the little town of Barry, close to Insight Meditation Society, and so Roger had just been asking uh, Lumpur Sumato about um, the uh, the practice of going on arms round in a in a Western country where most people wouldn't understand what they were doing. So Roger starts off by saying, in my own mind, and I imagine in the minds of others as well, the arms round might seem to be a type of clinging to form, to tradition. Lumpur responds, then one isn't being mindful. It would just be clinging to a method, but that is still better than what most people cling to, isn't it? And Roger replies, I'm not sure. Is it possible to place a value judgment on clinging? However, uh, how one does keep the mind? Uh, how does one keep the mind awake day and night, while performing certain rituals, chanting or or on arms round? How can one avoid the repetitive mechanical routine of our daily existence? And Paul replies, "Daily existence is mechanical and routine. The body is mechanical and routine. Society is that way. All compounded things just keep doing the same thing over and over." But our minds don't have to be deluded by those habits anymore. Roger responds, Krishnamurti says that, quote, religious people, those who live in a monastery, in isolation, or go off to a mountain or a desert, are forcing their minds to conform to an established pattern. That's a quote from uh, Krishnamurti's book, Freedom from the Known. You said earlier that, uh, that at Ajahn Chah's monastery you were conforming to an authority because you felt that previously, then Lumpur interrupts, one is conforming one's bodily action to a pattern. That's all. Yes, Krishnamurti says forcing minds to a pattern. The mind does conform to an established pattern, not just the body. It's dependent. Lumpur responds, right. That is samatha practice believing in doctrines and absorbing into conditions, but that's not the purpose of Buddhist meditation. Then Roger asks, 
Samatha practice is conforming to doctrines? And Paul replies, if one believes in doctrines, that shapes the thoughts in one's mind to accept certain doctrinal teachings and reject those which don't fit. There's also the samatha practice of tranquility, where one trains the mind to concentrate on an object. This practice calms and steadies the mind. And Roger responds, and you're calling that an established pattern? Yes. The normal rhythm of one's breath is an established pattern to which you cling and are attached, isn't it? It gives some tranquility to the mind. Roger replies, one does not cling to the breath. Breathing happens naturally. One might say that one observes the breath. And Paul replies, one focuses solely on the breath. At one particular moment, one is concentrating and not noticing any other object. Roger asks, I don't quite follow. What does that have to do with the mind habitually following certain dogmas? Then Lumpur explains, whatever is a pattern or a condition, a sankhara, if one believes in that sankhara, one becomes that. If one attaches to any object, one becomes that object. So, when one is concentrating on the normal breath, one becomes that normal breath. One's mental form is molded by the breath. One becomes one with that object for as long as the concentration lasts. The same holds for doctrines. They are the worlds of forms, conventions and habits. One can be likened to a doctrinal belief in the thoughts of others, in teachings and in creeds, in what other people say, in Krishnamurti, which is the problem with his disciples. Mindfulness is not clinging. What Krishnamurti point, is pointing to is awareness of the changing nature of the way things really are in the moment. But he seems to delude people by the fact that he started teaching from a very high place. Most people, even if they think about what he's teaching, cannot understand it. It's something one knows through letting go. Even if believing in Krishnamurti, or of trying to figure out what he's talking about, one has to come down to a very low level of humility, what Ajahn Chah calls an earthworm level, just being very simple and not expecting any results, doing good and refraining from doing evil with body, speech and mind, and being mindful. Well, to me, this is a very interesting dialogue. I hope uh, all of you can, can follow that. It's a little bit um, uh, tricky because, in a way, Roger Wheeler doesn't seem to be quite getting Lumpur Sumedho's point, which he, he, he says. He's asking questions. I don't, under, I don't understand that. Um, but uh, whereas he's sort of uh, uh, using the term samatha as referring to concentration practice in meditation, Lumpur is also referring to that as the way the mind holds a doctrine or an opinion, a, a belief or a, 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 an, an idea of any kind. And so that the, the, the questioner is having, having to sort of step outside his normal frame, uh, framework of um, references his uh, frames of reference to get what Lumpur is saying. But uh, uh, Lumpur then sp sort of spells it out in more detail. So you focus on the breath and you, you absorb that, you become the breath. When you're fully uh, absorbed, when there is absorption, then you, you become the breath. Everything else is shut out of the picture. The mind deliberately excludes everything except the rhythm of those feelings. That's what is meant by absorption. Um, so that the, there's a deliberate screening out. You've become that. So similarly, when you become a Buddhist or you, you become a Krishnamurti devotee or you become a, uh, a doctor or a, whatever it might be, that you focus on that, you put everything else out of the picture and that, that is easily made into something that is absolute. And so the point I, I feel that he's making very skillfully is that... Um, if, we're, if there's genuine mindfulness there, if we're practicing in a, in a skillful way, then there isn't that clinging, or at least the, when there is an absorption, you know, uh, the mind is now absorbing. There's a deliberate setting aside, okay, for this period of time, I'm going to absorb in this, I'm going to focus just on this and deliberately put everything else uh, uh, to one side. Uh, and and in, in the Buddha's teaching on uh, on concentration practices, in a number of suttas, he points out that uh, in, in skillful development of, of absorption into the jhanas and even the arupa jhanas, the formless, at least the first uh, few of the, the arupa jhanas, 
he talks about the sustaining of mindfulness and the, and the the quality of objectivity uh, along the way. So recognizing, oh, this is a state of absorption. This is something that is conditioned and, and thus dependent. It's it's dependently originated. It's it's impermanent. So even as the mind is absorbing and getting more and more focused in a more and more refined way, there's still that quality of of uh, of recollection. And uh, and in in the particular sutra I'm thinking of, the Buddha says how that can be sustained. That kind of objectivity that this is conditioned and thus gross. This is a dependently originated quality that can be sustained all the way up till the sort of the the last two levels of absorption of the neither perception nor non-perception level or. Um, the uh, nirodha samapati, the cessation of perception and feeling, that the mind is so focused, so refined, that that is impossible to reflect uh, uh, in that in that way at that stage. But at the other levels of absorption below that, I think the, the even at levels of uh, the plane of no thingness or the uh, or the plane of infinite consciousness or infinite space, it's still possible to recognize. So oh, this is conditioned and thus gross. This is a dependently originated and impermanent quality. So that that sense of mindfulness and an awareness of and uh, and uh, say clarity of what's going on is able to be sustained even in in absorptive even when the mind is is absorbed it can be sustained in that way and so that uh, and his last comments about uh, Krishnamurti, um, that was this was uh, uh, something that uh, Lumpur Sumedha would would, uh, would sometimes reflect, and other people said the same thing. Was that one of the difficulties with uh, Krishnamurti's teaching, even though it's an extremely high and refined wisdom, oftentimes people found it difficult to to uh, uh, approach or to to sort of get where he was coming from, almost like he's speaking from a very high place, and people sort of couldn't get across the. Uh, the gap to to sort of join him at that from that that high point of view, because he very deliberately uh, avoided methodologies. It's not uh, as, as as I understand that the Krishnamurti's way of uh, speaking about spirituality. It's not a progressive teaching. It's more sort of uh, a quality of uh, direct awareness, direct knowing, and that even though that might have might well have been what uh, Krishnamurti's direct experience was his own his own uh, say realization it was often very very hard for his students to 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 uh, say get a a direct experience of what he was talking about and to relate to him and to um uh, see uh, and one one time i remember lumpur saying that krishnamurti was like a pacheka buddha was that he had a a very powerfully uh, uh, clear and uh, and reliable wisdom, but he couldn't form a sangha. He couldn't form a a, a, a community because somehow that uh, the the, um, the the teaching or couldn't ca couldn't come across in the same way. He didn't have the same range of skillful means that, uh, say, a, a teacher like uh, Gautama Buddha, uh, the the founder of our our. Uh, religious tradition was able to do that was a, a big range of skillful means and a progressive teaching that made it more uh, more of a, a, a say uh, accessible and more practical for for a larger number of people so um, uh, I never met Krishnamurti myself and I've read very few of his teachings so I can't speak from direct experience but that's the kind of um, uh, say uh, perspective that Lumpur is expressing here that Krishnamurti is speaking uh, his his truth and his understanding from a from a very high place as he puts it. Um, uh, but most people, even if they think about what he's teaching, cannot understand it. Trying to to um, get to that, and I, I, I think I remember Lumpur Sumedha talking about when he was a. Um, a student uh, in in the mid 60s in uh, in Berkeley having read some of Krishnamurti's teachings and sitting in a in a in the in the gardens of the university or in a park and looking at a flower and he's saying Krishnamurti is saying well, just look at the flower everything is there and he's looking at a flower and saying it's just a flower <laughs> i'm not i'm not getting it and a feeling of, of frustration that he as a as a um, spiritual aspirant in those days before he'd gone off to asia um, trying to, to to get that, so it also reflects a little bit, as as I recall, uh, uh, Lumpur Sumedha's own uh, frustrations or, or, or inability to to see things from Krishnamurti's perspective. So, any questions on that before I continue?
There are some microphones here. Okay, I'll carry on. So he changes the subject at this point. The Roger Wheeler asks, why do religions degenerate? Lumpur responds, because they are only conventional truth. They're not ultimate truth. That's so the, uh, referring to religions as the 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 the, the, the constructed uh, agreed forms of society. So that the what you might call religiosity. That's a bit of an unusual word, but the it's not just the the uh, essence of a religion that they're talking about here, or what they are referring to, but the structures of a religion, like the, the words of the teaching, the, the forms, the rituals, the, the customs, the scriptures, uh, that's what uh, Lumpur is referring to. Because they're only conventional truth. They are not ultimate truth. Roger then goes on to say, but people don't practice. They practice mechanically. When a teacher conducts a course here, the question often arises, Buddhism is known as a peaceful religion. And it's said that a war has never begun in the cause of Buddhism. But look at Tibet and Cambodia. People were massacred. In Laos, the monks are working in the fields. One visiting Cambodian monk said that basically people don't practice, and that's why things fall apart, why there's so much trouble. Lumpur responds, well, why is the world as it is? Why were two million Cambodians annihilated? One can speculate. But the only thing that one can know is that the conditions of one's mind, greed, hatred and delusion, are the reflection of the world, the way it is. The world has murders, violent death, atrocities and destruction because we commit them all the time in our minds too. What did you do before you were ordained, or even now that you are ordained? You try to annihilate a lot of things from your mind, don't you? If you have anger, jealousy, nasty thoughts, you annihilate them because you think that's the way to solve the problem. One annihilates what one thinks is the cause of one's suffering. Now apply that to a country like Cambodia. The Khmer Rouge government believed that the middle class bourgeoisie was the cause of all suffering, so the government annihilated it. That works on the same principle. Buddhist teachings are non-violent. One doesn't annihilate pests, but understands that even the pests of the mind are impermanent and non-self. They'll disappear on their own. Many things we're frightened of are really our best friends, like fear itself. We are afraid of the unknown, but the unknown is the way to enlightenment. Not knowing is what brings terror into people's lives. Many people spend much of their lives just trying to find security in some form or another because of fear. Fear drives them to become this or get hold of that to save up a lot of money, to seek pleasure, or a safe place to live, or to find some ideal person they hope will make them happy forever. That is fear of being alone, fear of the unknown, of what we cannot know. In meditation, when one is mindful, seeing that very fear as it really is leads us into the deathless, into silence. Yet fear is something to which we react, we react very strongly. So, if one can, uh, cannot be at peace with the pest of one's mind, then I cannot very well expect a stupid government like the Khmer Rouge or the elements of the world to be any better. We have no right to point the, bl to point the blame at things as big as society, to find fault with America, that's easy to do, or with Cambodia or Tibet, because the monks didn't practice hard enough, or the Cambodian people were not good Buddhists. That's a bit silly, actually. What are you doing about it? That is what I'm saying. I cannot help Pol Pot's screwed up vision of the world. How he intended to solve the problem was idiocy. But I have seen that very same idiocy in myself. The desire to wipe out what I don't like. Or what I think is the cause of the world's or my own suffering. That's why one can see how the problem arises. One can say, oh, the monks weren't good enough. But that isn't fair, really. The next question wasn't recorded, so we're not quite sure what, what Roger asked, but Lumpur responded, uh, carried on. I've had a very, a very fortunate experience with a Buddhist monk, Ajahn Chah, and I see what a very happy, tolerant and harmonious being he is. 
Of course, many of his disciples don't understand what he's teaching, though he certainly makes it all very clear and offers them every occasion to practice and find out. When one talks about dukkha, the first noble truth, one isn't talking in abstract about dukkha out there, existing as some sort of undefined thing. I'm talking about that very feeling in one, in myself, which does not, uh, which does not feel quite happy or feels a bit upset, worried, discontented, insecure, or ill at ease. One experiences the first noble truth within oneself. One isn't pointing to dukkha as some sort of vague thing that hovers over the world. If one really looks at one's mind, one finds discontentment, restlessness, fear and worry there. That is something one can see in oneself. One doesn't have to believe. It would be idiocy to say, I believe in the first noble truth, or I don't believe in the first noble truth. I believe that everything is wonderful. It's not a matter of believing or disbelieving, but, uh, but rather of looking inside and asking, do I always feel wonderful and happy? Is life just a constant source of joy and gaiety, or do I sometimes feel depression, doubt, fear, etc.? Just speaking from my own experience, I could very much see the first noble truth. It was not that I wanted a more depressing ideology to accept. I recognized that there were fear, uncertainty, and uneasiness in myself. But the first noble truth isn't a doctrine. It's not saying life is suffering, but just saying there is this. Suffering comes and goes. It arises, the second noble truth. It ceases, the third noble truth. And from that understanding comes the eightfold path, the fourth noble truth which is a clear vision of the transcendence of it all through mindfulness. The Eightfold Path is just being mindful in daily life. And Roger responds, yet mindfulness itself is not a wholesome factor. And Lumpur says, it's neutral. It doesn't belong to anybody. It's not something one is lacking. It's not a personal possession. Then Roger says, uh, there are wholesome and unwholesome mental factors. There are factors which are always present, like mindfulness. Mindfulness isn't innately good. Lumpur says finally, it's awareness of good and evil as change. But using the wisdom factor of discriminating alertness, satipanya, one sees the conditions of good and evil as impermanent and not self. This mindfulness wisdom liberates one from the delusion that these conditions tend to give. And there's a, a few things in there that um, uh, covers quite a, a bit of ground in that, that section. Um, the, uh, there was often, the, you know, particularly in those days, um, the, the, uh, the question it came up often with uh, Lumpur Cha being asked as well about Thailand and saying, well, uh, how, can these, uh, how can such terrible things happen in these Buddhist countries? Um, you know, what... what uh, What's the cause you know, of a Buddhist country like Tibet or Cambodia or Laos? Um, how could such terrible things happen to the, the people there? And uh, or people would ask Ajahn Chah, yeah, how, uh, how come there's so much corruption or prostitution or, or um, uh, you know, life is, is so uh, difficult for people in Thailand? It's a Buddhist country. How, uh, how come the, you know, all these unskillful, unskillful, unwholesome things go on there? And so that uh, I feel that, uh, just as Lumpur Cha would say, Lumpur Sumedha is bringing it back uh, to the mind. And rather than getting drawn into talking about political issues or large-scale social issues, um, and at this time, this is 1981, so this was still um, in the uh, the era, era when the Khmer Rouge were, were active. They had, um, uh, they, I think, had been largely deposed the Vietnamese army had invaded Cambodia in 1979 but um, it was still they were very much a, a force in the world and it was becoming clear the extent of the destruction that had happened under the, the Khmer Rouge um, in, the, in this period um, but I feel that uh, Lumpur's um, effort here is very very significant and in a way is a, one of the main principles of why the Buddha chose to be a spiritual teacher rather than a, a political leader was that, um, that uh, 
the, the, the mind of the individual is where we can make a, a genuine difference. It doesn't mean to say that people can't form governments and pass laws that are, are beneficial or, or are harmful. Those, those choices can be made and skillful principles can be established in the, the social order. But uh, uh, what was the, the effort of the Buddha's life was to, yeah, to uh, say, pass on the skills of changing your own mind and then seeing how that then can uh, ripple through, trickle through into the society through the various different contacts. The more people that you have in a society whose hearts are free of greed, hatred, and delusion, the more those principles can be embodied in the way the society operates and what can, can inform what is skillful, what's beneficial, what, what's valuable in a society. And so that... Um, uh, I think uh, I'm not sure if if uh, Roger uh, Wheeler un com completely understood what Lumpur was saying, but I feel it's a it's very um, uh, significant because it's it's easy for us to get drawn into the large scale social issues and to um, get say uh, swept up in that. And, uh, and I have regular appeals from people writing to me and asking of us to to post uh, statements on the, on our website or go or publish. Um, um, uh, on, uh, say uh, our position on on various large scale social issues, uh, it's a, a big variety of things uh, that people uh, uh, have you know, have uh, strong feelings about for for good reasons. But uh, I, uh, for myself, I tr I tend to to try and follow the principles embodied by the Buddha, by uh, Lumpur Cha, Lumpur Sumato, where the the what we're doing here in a monastery is we are changing this world for changing our own minds our own hearts and that and then from those genuine changes within the, the lives uh, the hearts and minds of, of individuals then that that genuine change and the change of perspective and those those qualities can then uh, spread out in, into society um, that uh, with without that kind of understanding of one's own mind, and uh, and I think Lumpur spells it out really skillfully, really clearly here, uh, that uh, uh, if you're approaching your own mental training uh, with uh, you know, annihilating the pests of your own mind, <coughs> then you uh, you're not really understanding or haven't learned how to work uh, with your own difficulties in a non-contentious way and that, that as he says buddhist teachings are non-violent so that's right in our own meditation so if we are meeting with something that is say unwholesome unskillful uh, an angry thought or a lustful thought or a, a feeling of fear or regret or you know, anxiety um, then it's important that we uh, uh, learn how to relate to those unskillful uh, uh, painful qualities with an attitude of non-contention that we, we learn how to work with our heart of loving kindness with even with that which is really unwholesome destructive and and, and painful and that um that the more that we as individuals uh, here uh, giving our time our energy to that inner transformation the more effective that is on a genuine level then the more that can be communicated into society and, and can ripple through and that was uh, i think it's important to recognize that's that was the buddha's choice too that by changing his own mind and then conveying to others how to do that for themselves that's why this this print this uh, teaching has managed to survive and be effective uh, for more than two and a half thousand years. And that uh, uh, one of the things they says Buddhism is known as a peaceful, peaceful religion. It's said that a war has never begun in the cause of Buddhism. And that, uh, and I feel that uh, on a larger scale, <laughs> that it, that's a very important principle because uh, uh, there's, there's nowhere in the Pali Canon where you can find that um, yeah, the, 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 any kind of sanctioning of taking life for any wholesome, uh, any wholesome purpose. There's no, there's no way that you can, you can kill for a good reason. It's, there's absolutely nothing that backs it up, and there's not a syllable in the whole of the Pali Canon that backs that up. And I feel that's extraordinary, help, extraordinarily helpful and beneficial um, uh, that uh, the... Um, that nobody can manipulate the teaching. You have had countries where they declare themselves to be Buddhist, or they, they people will say they're doing this in the name of Buddhism. But I would say that's a, a travesty or a, a flagrant misuse of the teaching as using the form of a, the religion as a sort of uh, a, a badge or to give people credibility or to um, 
to, uh, but it, it's not really a practice of the, the religion. It's just using the the external forms of the the religion as a uh, as a uniform, as a sort of flag to wave. But what's actually driving the the actions is much more ordinary, um, the, so political competition and uh, and the the usual forces that drive society. So I feel that that on a sort of political or historical level, you you can't fight a war. <laughs> in the Buddha's name, that transfers into our own practice. That, uh, that the, your, um, uh, in order to, to work with the mind, uh, then there needs to be that absolute uh, solid ground of non-contention. That sometimes working with, with uh, uh, ugly states of mind, unskillful states of mind, you need to be very clear and say, no. <laughs> But you can say no, just as a parent can say that to their child or to a or to a, a, a puppy. You know, no, sit, good dog, good dog, well done. <laughs> you can be firm and uh, and clear in training the mind, but that's based on kindness and on love, not on on aversion or hatred. And so that um, uh, I feel that what Lumpur is uh, trying to convey to um, to his inquirer here is is uh, uh, very much uh, uh, in that spirit that you know, there, there can be unskillful, unwholesome qualities that arise in our mind, but we can learn to work with them in the most skillful and beneficial ways. So if, you, if, you, if an unskillful, unwholesome quality arises and the way that it is worked with is wholesome and beneficial, right there you're creating the causes for peacefulness and clarity. You're planting the causes for for what's beneficial and liberating uh, right there. So that even if you're dealing with lust or anger or jealousy, uh, uh, restlessness, uh, that's a, yeah, like a, an akusala, uh, an unwholesome object. But if it's worked with in a wholesome way, it's you know, receiving the, the negative or painful quality of that object and then transforming it. You're, t you're taking the, the, uh, the, the energy of that and and reshaping it, uh, you're using it as a as a means of planting the causes of peace and and freedom, and that's a, a lot of our work in, in meditation. So, uh, and I often em emphasize this in in meditation instruction is that we need to have this ground of non contention of of, um, of loving kindness, which doesn't mean making ourselves like everything. So, when you're feeling lustful or angry or jealous. Um, you know, or restless, you're not saying, oh, how my, my anger is so beautiful, or oh, hooray, more lust, great, this is marvelous. You're not trying to pretend that the, the unskillful is skillful, but rather you're saying, here it is. Uh, this is. This is something that the mind can experience, these feelings of restlessness or aversion, or fear or desire. Yeah, this is part of the human uh, field of, of, of possibilities. Here it is. Um, and so I, I like to use this term radical acceptance as a way of representing uh, the core of the real heart essence of loving kindness. That there's that openness of heart to say, well, in this moment, there is this. It's this way. And the anger feels like this, or uh, desire feels like this, fear feels like this, restlessness uh, or uh, jealousy feels like this. And that very quality of acceptance. There's a determination not to contend, not to, not to argue, not to fight, and that very uh, attitude of non-contention. It it takes away the the strength, the 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 the, the viability, the, the the liveliness of that unskillful object. It's no, oh, this is a mental event. This isn't me and mine. It's just a an impermanent. Uh, it's of an impermanent nature and just as uh, Lumpur says yeah, it's awareness of good and evil as change that yeah this is something that's, that's unwholesome, it's unskillful but it is changing, it has arisen it's, it's, it's a mental event and that right there is, is say, setting the ground or, 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 or say um, planting the, the seeds for, for, for peace, for, for clarity for freedom so any particular questions, comments? Don't be shy. If you can get the microphone. Oh. Thank you.
Monsieur Gaspard. Peut Um, my question is going back to uh, how we use convention, especially language. Um, um, I'm sorry, I'm coming to how um, we uh, let's try and, and form this not from a self view, but in terms of my um, experience of humanity in certain ways that we use language and uh, or conventional sense of language you know the common stuff is right no there is no right and wrong or there's no good and bad there's lots of views and opinions around these areas and uh, I remember um, asking uh, Geshe Lau about the uh, the convention of Mahayana, he would say it's a human, very much a human convention, and it's made by humans, and it's got, it's obviously flaws in that convention, because it's a human one. And uh, it's not ultimately, you know, ultimate truth in that sense, but it points to that, you know, if you uh, use it in a skillful way. So, you know, the language which is used, particularly in you know, Buddhism, is appealing to me in that sense that it's quite clear and in some ways at least and uh, so my feeling is that um, it seems that's the biggest stumbling block for humans as individuals is in that area of language and convention I just wondered how I feel that the um, the idea of two truths, which is particularly more Mayanan, which is uh, how um, one can express in conventional terms ultimately existing things, but they're not true for you at that kind of moment, you know, if we're using conventional language to express them. I was just wondering what your feelings are on that. Uh, well, I would say that um, the, the idea of the two levels of truth is that's, that's throughout the Buddhist world. I mean, Samuti Satcha and Paramatta Satcha, like conventional truth and ultimate truth, that, that's, as much, that's very much a part of the southern Buddhist world as well. And so, um, uh, and I feel one of, the, the, uh, one of the things that attracted me towards uh, uh, the, uh, the Buddhist path is that it's, it's very clear that uh, the the truth can't be encapsulated in the words. And that it's a, one of the rare spiritual teachings that acknowledges the limitation of language and concept. And that, um, and so that uh, the, the, uh, there's, a, there's a particular teaching, I think it's um, in, in the Diga Nikaya, I think it, uh, I'm not absolutely sure, I think it's Sutta number nine, uh, I think it's the Potapada Sutta in the Diga Nikaya. And the, the Buddha speaks about the, the use of language and how, uh, and maybe I was uh, talking about this the other day, he said he takes something like a, 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 a dish, He's, and he, uh, he probably had a, sort of something next to him, he said, you know, in, in Vangsa they call this such and such, in, in Anga they call it such and such, in Magadha they call it such and such, in, in Kolya they call it such and such, in Uttarakura they call it such and such. And he goes through like nine different names for the same thing, they call it a saucer or a dish or a bowl, um, and uh, it's the same thing. But they, they, uh, uh, the, there are different words that are used to refer to it. It's this. <laughs> and the words are, are, are the conventions that are employed to, to, uh, to refer to that perception of that object. And so uh, and in that, that, uh, that teaching, the Buddha points out how you know, if there's wisdom, he said the Tathagata uses the conventions of language without delusion, so that you know it's a convention. So when you say I, you know that's uh, a convenient fiction. It's, like a, it's referring to a set of experiences or per perceptions. It's not declaring an absolute independent entity to be to be the reality. But it's just a. a and so I think in the same sutta, someone asks the Buddha, um, "Well, you, if all dhammas are not self, how how come you use these personal pronouns like uh, we, you, they, I?" 
And then the the Buddha goes on to ex explain, well, the, that yes, the, those are the conventions of language, but the Tathagata uses them without confusion or without delusion. He knows they are merely conventions. And uh, so to, to me, that's, uh, that was one of the things that really attracted me towards Buddhism. Is, it's like the forms uh, and the structures of, of language and the traditions and the, the customs of, sort of bowing and chanting and the robes and so on. Yeah, they're conventional forms, but they are very deliberately pointing to that which is beyond convention, that which transcends form. And so they're, they're not trying to represent that. So the word dhamma is just a sound. The, the word dhamma is just a word. <laughs> it's not the dhamma. <laughs> so the word microphone isn't a microphone. It's a word. <laughs> it's just a, a set of sounds. But those set, that set of sounds has a particular meaning in the, the, uh, that uh, forms in the minds of every, everyone here. I mean, most people here don't have English as their first language. I think Venerable Chitta Sangwaro, maybe you, Paul, I think, and Ajahn Kachana, I think. <laughs> we have English as our first language. Everybody else started with something, something different as their first language. Looking around, <laughs> so but the, those words, microphone, they 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 trigger a set of perceptions and assumptions and associations. Even if it wasn't English, wasn't your first language, you've you've learned that. So if along the way you recognise, oh, this is a convention, it's only a, a means then it can serve its purpose. The, the problems come, and maybe the, uh, and, uh, it seems like this is what you were asking, when we assume that the words or the opinions or the concepts are the actual reality. That, that, that's where it becomes, uh, that, be, that becomes tricky. And, um, and so uh, we, uh, I've often told how when, when I first went to Wat Nanachat, uh, I got really irritated by the monks kept saying, they kept talking about views and opinions. And we were getting into, you know, long discussions over this and that and the other. And I say, no, it's not an opinion, it's a fact. And they say, yeah, it's your opinion that it's a fact. Like, no, 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 this is a fact. It's true. They say, yeah, it's your opinion that it's true. <laughs> <laughs> and so a part of our monastic jargon is like, you know, we, we use terms like views and opinions a lot, or conventions we use a lot. In ordinary everyday society, you know, on the, you know, uh, when people used to travel together on buses and <laughs> trains, <laughs> then, uh, yeah, in ordinary everyday family conversations on the bus or on the train, we don't use those kind of terms very much, like conventions or views and opinions. But in, in monastery jargon, they used a lot. So it began to irritate me, like, why do they keep talking about views and opinions? Because uh, yeah, I always thought that if I think something is true, I'm right. And if other people disagree, they might mean well, but they're wrong. So I could be very conceited. But then, and so at first it was just, it was just annoying to me. And then I began to, uh, but they, they kept you know, very politely and consistently <laughs> saying the same kind of thing. And then I began to see how after a couple of months in the monastery, something that I was sure of as a fact, I discovered that I was thinking differently. And it dawned on me, uh, it, took, it took a few weeks, uh, oh, that's interesting. So uh, if I'm right now, and I think differently from what I thought six weeks ago, what does that say about my rightness then? And what does that say about my rightness now? Oh, if you follow that, I thought, oh. Okay, that's what they're talking about. <laughs> so, uh, yes, I feel that I'm right. I feel this is a, this is a true fact, but that's the, how the mind's holding it in this moment. And the views and opinions, perceptions are continually changing. They're modulating all the time. And they're dependent on the, the time, the place, the situation, and so forth. So in terms of, of our practice, uh, and using the, the practice to genuinely liberate the heart, then what matters, what's really valuable, is recognizing every perception, every opinion, every belief, every plan, every memory, it can only be an approximation. Sabe sankara dukkha, all forms are unsatisfactory. They are incomplete, they're imperfect. They can only be an estimate, a, guess, a, sort of a, a best guess, an approximation. And so that... Um, 
that doesn't mean to say that they're not useful. I mean, like a building, you know, a building starts falling down as soon as you build it, you know, even as you're building it. <laughs> it doesn't even wait till you've finished before it starts decaying. But it's still, you know, it's, it's frosty outside, it's a cold winter night. But the, this condition holds together, it, it is just a convention, it's just a, a form that's put together. But it's put together in such a way that we can, we can sit together, we can see each other, we can hear each other, and be sheltered from the cold and the dark, and, and it's, a, it's a good enough shelter. It's a, it's a good enough truth, it's a good enough approximation. Even if it is impermanent, it serves a purpose. So even though um, uh, words are only um, uh, part, I mean, half truths or partially true, they can only convey a, a, a shadow of, of the full meaning, uh, they, they're good enough. And uh, so one of the, the, the teachings that I quote very, very often is in the Kevada Sutta where the Buddha says that there's two kinds of miracle. There's the, the miracle of psychic power and the miracle of instruction. And the, the two uh, of these two, the superior is the miracle of instruction. That, you know, the, uh, that you can put these imperfect and incomplete words together and they can impact the, the, the heart of the listener in such a way that their uh, understanding of reality is, is irre irreversibly transformed. You know, people can hear a Dhamma talk and be fully enlightened. Uh, and uh, that, that, that's a miracle. <laughs> so, uh, uh, so I feel that's one of the, um, the great sort of blessings. And it's so clear within the Buddhist teaching. I mean, other spiritual tra traditions, like say in, in uh, the, um, the tradition of the, um, the Bible, you know, the, you know, the, the, the Talmud or the Quran, you know, the, the, the 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 word is is the truth like this is the word of the lord you know like when i was a, a school kid um then the um the the end of a bible reading would would be finished with the words this is the word of the lord you know, this is what god said you know this is the bible this is the absolute truth and you sort of skip over the fact that it was in english <laughs> <laughs> so the King James version of the Bible, but uh, it, it, that that is uh, you know, a, a powerful and important principle in those religions. Say in in the, say the the uh, Hebrew Bible or the um, the the Quran of um, of Islam. The you know those forms, the, those words, those sounds. They they have a a, a kind of intrinsic value and, and an absolute meaning in and of themselves. So the, what we have in the, in the Pali tradition is very different. The Buddha took a, a different approach. And, uh, and it's also interesting um, to me that what we have in the Tipitaka is not uh, the word of the Buddha, it's the word of Ananda, mostly. What Ananda remembered at the First Council. Thus have I heard, so that uh, I'm not trying to be heretical with this, but uh, and so uh, and obviously many of the teachings uh, are um, say uh, very much sort of uh, uh, say the word of the Buddha as we we understand it to be, but the majority of the teachings, like all of the suttas, uh, the say the Majjhima Nikaya, the Digha Nikaya, um, they they begin with Ewang Me Sutang. Thus have I heard. So it's not even in the form of this is the absolutely true word of the Buddha. It's right there in the scripture. It's this is what Ananda remembered. Ewang me sutang. This is what this is what I heard. Or in the Vinaya discipline, um, the occasion was this: the Venerable Upali. It's the words of the Venerable Upali at the first council. The occasion was this, and then it's it's the the recollection of what Upali, Venerable Upali, said at the first council. So right there in the sort of the holy scripture, the, the you know, these sacred books of ours, which can, you know, contain all these extremely important and powerful teachings, the framework is this is what is remembered, and so that it's passed on not as an absolute fact or an absolute truth, but this is what is remembered. So even in the way that it's phrased, there's a uh, anyway an, an encouragement to to be. Um, uh, receiving it and reflecting on it and not taking it as this is the absolute fact this particular Pali word is an absolute truth but rather 
it, the words can only point to uh, certain qualities uh, of the of the mind and the world, and then through that pointing, then uh, that uh, transformation of the heart can be catalyzed. That's the, that, and that to me is the miracle. Through the the the, the conventions and limited meaning of, of the various words, then. Uh, the the change of heart can happen, and that and that's real. That's genuine. That, that that's a a, um, a kind of uh, uh, it, it's a um, something of of genuine meaning and value of absolute uh, absolute value in, in the in the world. It's a, the enables the, the dhamma to be realized. So that uh, uh, in terms of, of language. And concepts that we have, I feel that uh, the Buddhist tradition really keeps that in a skillful perspective, and it, it tries to mitigate the tendency to attach to particular uh, opinions or expressions or concepts, or or saying you know, the the word is it. It's always sort of pointing back to it's the mind of the of the the listener, the the individual. That that is it. <laughs> the, the words are just words. So, you know, you treat them with respect and and. Uh, and uh, with, with gratitude, but you are not saying oh, the absolute reality is contained in the in the ink on this page. Yes, Philippe. Um, <clears throat> but in the ultimate reality, is there? Um, can I say wholesome and unwholesome action, intention? Who is it as well? Who, yeah, like killing someone, it's a fact, it's unwholesome. Who, yeah, or not? <laughs> uh, on the level of convention, it's extremely unwholesome. Yeah. So, uh, again, Ajahn Chah would, would talk about this. Um, uh, he would say, people talk about doing good and refraining from evil, but that which is beyond good and evil, they don't talk about, they don't know about. And so that was a fairly um, common theme for him. So it's not sanctioning a any kind of conduct. It's, uh, it's not saying, uh, and some spiritual teachings, they, they say that, like, you know, if, if you're enlightened, you can't, you can't do any wrong. And um, that... Uh, it's a uh, that which is a I would say is a really dangerous kind of wrong view, and that uh, a number of number of spiritual teachings and teachers have have spoken in that way over the over the years. But I feel that's a really deluded and uh, incorrect view. Um, so in, I would say, uh, in its essence, yeah, dhamma is sort of beyond good and evil, but the the effect of dhamma being genuinely realized. It look from the outside. It looks like a, a an uh, an absolute adherence to doing good, and an absolute uh, uh, say avoidance of any kind of evil. From the inside, there it's not choosing good over evil. But from the outside, it looks that way. So, does that make sense? Sort of, kinda. <laughs> so, for example, um, there's a a a, 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 um, a sutta where um, the, the Buddha is speaking to, to somebody called Suttava, and uh, he's talking about uh, the, the, the character of an arahant. He said that an arahant is incapable of deliberately taking life. They cannot do that. It's not like that there's a rule that says, now you're an arahant, you can never break the first precept. It's like they, they cannot deliberately take the life of another living being. They, they cannot steal. Uh, they, they are they are incapable of carrying out a kind of deliberate theft. They are they cannot engage in any kind of sexual activity. That there's no interest in that. There's no inclination in them to relate to another be to relate to another being in a sexual way. They cannot tell a lie. That the tongue can't form a, f a falsehood deliberately. And so that uh, from the outside it looks like oh this person is very well behaved. That they are, they are, they are doing good, um, but from the inside, that's the only inclination of the, the the mind. It's like because the mind is the embodiment of dhamma. In an arahant, 
the mind is dhamma without any kind of um, distorting influences or anything that uh, any kind of greed, hate, or, or delusion that, that clouds that or distorts it. So their life is a manifestation of of, of dhamma in a in a I would say in a complete and pure way. And so that the inclination towards action is harmlessness, is is a fewness of needs, is a respectfulness, is an honesty. So that uh, it's not as though uh, an arahant has to sort of restrain their unwholesome impulses. It's like there's nothing there that would drive that or make them do that. And so that um, uh, it's important not to get the two levels of truth, the conventional truth and ultimate truth, confused with each other. And that's what I think uh, 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 that uh, Anagarika Paul was, was also addressing. Because, uh, and as I, as I was saying, there are some spiritual teachers that say, oh, if you're enlightened, everything you do is enlightened activity. This is, you know, uh, angry Buddha, lustful Buddha, drunk Buddha, uh, confused Buddha. And uh, I mean, you, you can find in print, <laughs> probably in our library, you've got the, a number of spiritual teachers who, who have talked in those terms. But to, to me, that's one of the worst kinds of delusion. That is, basically, you're kidding yourself, and that somebody might have had a a very profound experience, and then tell themselves, "Oh, I've had this profound experience of awakening, therefore I'm fully enlightened. Therefore, everything that I do is good." And then using that way of labeling things or the memory of that great experience uh, to then put a, a different. Uh, to, to, to see their own fear and their aversion and their doubts and their lustfulness, they, they put it into a different uh, framework. And so uh, many, many spiritual teachers have really uh, fallen into that. And I feel it's one of the reasons why <laughs> I've been drawn towards uh, Theravada Buddhism with a very clear Vinaya along with the, the Dhamma, because it spells it out that that uh, even if someone's fully enlightened, they still use the conventions of the the, the religion, and uh, there is the uh, the uh, the natural following of the precepts that comes with genuine enlightenment, and so that that clarity of of um, the conventional form and the and, and the ultimate realization, I feel, is is very very beneficial. Because otherwise, particularly if you've got a clever mind, you can, you know, the, the inner lawyer uh, or legal team can make an excuse for anything. <laughs> and that, uh, and I've known a number of people who have really dug themselves into very uh, deep holes <laughs> uh, uh, through that kind of um, convincing themselves that they were enlightened, but yet uh, ignoring or... or, or Reinterpreting their own their own fears or their own doubts or their own uh, preferences, um, and uh, and making excuses for it, not realizing actually I'm just I'm jealous of this person and I want all the attention, or this person is is sexually attractive, so I want to have them around, or this person is irritating and that's why I uh, you know I, I want to get rid of them because I don't like them. They, their, their mind will sort of conjure up a way of how it's all sort of good and perfect and, and proper. And, uh, and, my, and my experience of that is, is really it's just the, the, the thinking mind making excuses for very ordinary uh, standard human defilements. So uh, uh, if one takes the, 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 the practice and the teaching in, in, a, in a wholehearted way, then, um, then even if there, there has been uh, uh, like a, a powerful insight, or there is a recognition of iron, or like to quote William Shakespeare and in Hamlet, there is nothing good or evil of itself, but our thinking makes it so. Um, but uh, yeah, it's, there's no there's no good and evil, isn't it? Beyond good and evil, it's, it's uh, yeah, I, I see that that how could there be? You know, from the ultimate point of view, there is no good, there is no evil. That if that is uh, you know, not just an, a, 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 an attractive idea, or like a, an intellectual realization. Um, then, if that's really taken to heart, then that uh, the that will cause 
a, 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 an inclination towards wholesome action and a, and a leaning away, a disinclination towards what is unwholesome. Uh, that that uh, I, I see as a, a natural part of Buddha Dhamma. If the mind gets stuck on that idea, and then the the the, the, the maras get going and say, "Oh, well, therefore everything I do is good." Hey, this is cool. <laughs> so uh, I'm not so that uh, you all, you all can do the washing up. I'll just go and, and uh, do what I like because you know, and whatever you whatever opinion you have about me, that's your problem. Because I'm totally liberated, and so I mean, it's. It, uh, I don't want to make too much of a joke of it, but um, because it, it it can produce a lot of painful difficulties, both for yourself and the people around you, if that's if that's followed. So I feel if that insight that you know, let's say Lumpur was talking about Lumpur Cha, and that you know, people talk about cultivating good and and. Uh, and letting go of evil, but, they, but that which is beyond good and evil, they don't recognize. So it's important to, to, to see that the person who was saying that was a, a, an extremely well-behaved monk. <laughs> you know, someone who was completely harmless, completely honest, and incredibly uh, kind and generous uh, and benevolent. That was the result of seeing beyond good and evil. <laughs> so that... Uh, it's a. Uh, it's not a small issue. It's a. It's, it's a big issue, and and in uh, in one respect, it's one of the areas where the cleverer you are, the more you should worry, <laughs> because the thinking mind can often make really good excuses for why what I'm what I what I want is is all totally is all totally in accord with dhamma, and it's and it's sort of it's it's not being labelled as no. It's just. It's just a desire. <laughs> it's just sense desire. It's, it's nothing wholesome about it. It's a, it's a, don't make excuses. Well, be realistic. Be honest. And that, um, and so that uh, I'm not advocating being stupid. <laughs> and having intelligence can be an incredibly powerful tool, but it's an area to be careful of because often when the mind is very quick and can easily come up with with ideas and watertight. Reasoning, you know, like a reasoning that kind of that's perfectly logical, then you uh, you can think yourself into into a lot of difficulty and make and really create a lot of obstructions and and uh, problems for yourself and the people around you. So uh, I, I feel it's a, it's an important principle to really take to heart and that recognizing that that intrinsic with seeing beyond conventional truth the heart is embodying dhamma and then that embodiment of dhamma we say the 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 life of the buddha is is the best example of being dhamma so it, it manifests as uh, an incredible uh, kindness compassion um harmlessness you know, honesty and and, uh, and and generosity that's what it takes shape as. It doesn't take shape as you know, following impulses and, and treating other people as if they don't matter. So. Yes, Venerable Narinda, one last one. We're just after seven, and that, that was the end of that section. <clears throat> Ajahn, you were talking about um, uh, just now about, for instance, uh, if people ask um, about views on what happens in society, mm -hmm. uh, political views, and you were saying that um, if you, according to the Ajahn Chah or Lopo Semedo, just go back to one own, one own's mind and change that. Um, that is what I, how I would relate to it as well. I understand that. And... <clears throat> But it's slightly different when it comes really closer to home. Like if you hear stories, or when I remember stories from Lompo Semedo, okay, he might not have a strong opinion, or maybe he does, about communism and what is happening there. But once it comes really close to your monastery and <laughs> you think you're going to get killed, then he started to make plans to get away from it, for instance, right? Uh, so uh, personally, as a, uh, one of the reflections for oneself is, of course, okay, when you die, you die, and you, know, you, you practice with that uh, on a personal level. 
and on a um, opinion level, let's say on society, you park that and say, okay, that's societal stuff, we can, can watch and how, how I react on it. But something in between there, when things become closer, right? And, and how do you manage that? Like, do you go away and fear, or fear out of the, uh, fear for, from death, and you run away, basically? So I, I found it quite um, um, quite a um, dilemma right now. Like now you have uh, coronavirus time, let's say, in the last few months, um, and uh, you have. Of course, a lot of opinions and views about how serious it is, how not serious it is, how what we should do about it, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But there's also something of ourselves to practice about. Okay, that is what Buddha, the Buddha, has always been reminding us. So a personal uh, reflection. But then you also have what in between, like oh, how do you, uh, as uh, in, in in the community here? Deal with that. You can say, okay, my opinion to the outside world is okay. I have no opinion about particular whether vaccination is good or bad, coronavirus is good or bad, or how countries have taken care of it. But somehow, in between your own practice about death and and sickness, and also the monastery, one has to look at it and you have to act on it basically. And there, you really act out basically as a group what you think about it or how how you how you proceed with it. I'm sure you, in your position, you, you see people ranging from total fear of any disease until total, I don't care anything, I can die today, I don't, I don't mind, you right? And I guess there's a whole uh, range of that. And I just want to put this in perspective, that because I just came back from Thailand, and there it's more like, oh, by the way, it, there's a lot of dengue fever, uh, dengue, mos you know, mosquitoes with dengue fever here this season, so good luck, Hope, hopefully you don't, don't die, basically. And I come back here in, you know, any safety precautions, it seems like, to be taken. So I just wonder as a monk and in this community, how one relates to that uh, in-between state, let's say, not the societal issue or not the personal, but how to live among each other and what is the wise or right way to do? Yeah, good question. Um, uh, I, uh, you know, just using that example of the coronavirus, um, you discuss, you know, as a community, you come together and you, you get different people's perspectives. You you gather as much uh, information as uh, of as uh, an accurate nature as possible, and then bringing it together, then you come to a um, uh, a decision or decisions that that are good enough for most people. You know, it won't please everybody. But it's a, it's a, a say a, a process of finding a um, uh, a middle ground, and that uh, that uh, is always a, a balancing act. You know, listening to everyone, trying to uh, to sort of get as much clear information, and seeing what all the different factors are that are playing into a situation, and then rather than then holding it in terms of, oh, this is the right thing to do, and uh, this will necessarily have a good result. Uh, the, the whole way that you relate to decision-making is much more based on mindfulness and wisdom rather than self-view. Like, okay, this is the right thing, and, and uh, uh, so you should just believe that. But rather, this looks like a good way forward. Let's try this and see what happens. Let's see how it works. What's the result of it? So... And that's how I encourage people to relate to decision making in in all kinds of different situations in their their work life, the family life, and making their own choices. Rather, because we get very fixed on what's the right thing to do, and afraid of the wrong thing. We want to get it right. We don't want to get it wrong. We want success. We don't want failure. And the mind can inflate um, right and wrong, success and failure, as absolute qualities. Going back to the whole question of language, and that. Um, sometimes, yeah, and not just with, with, say, this coronavirus situation, but you know, with with all kinds of other uh, activities in different monasteries, you know, you make a choice about something, and then you realise, oh, oh, that was really a mistake, <laughs> and it, it can be an expensive mistake. Like, oh wow, that, that looked like a good idea at the time, but uh, actually, um, that made a lot of problems. But then, rather than, rather than thinking of that as an absolute bad. Okay, well, what did we learn from that? Okay, well, we know. Uh, don't put the drain pipes through that, uh, that part of the field because they won't drain there because of the soil. 
we need to put the and we learned that now so okay when we put the drain pipes in we do it this way we don't do it that way so um the the uh, the mind uh needs to frame decision making in a in a somewhat different way so you make the best decisions that you can from a sort of a, a community uh, consciousness, you know, drawing upon the different perspectives, and then you find some kind of a of a middle ground that that will please and work for most people, and with what you understand to be the practical or, or objective reality, you know that uh, that some people it'll be too tight, some people will be too loose. That's the way the uh, the the, we, uh, the people are. Um, and then, but then you keep your eye on it. You say, okay, well, what, uh, what's the the effect of this? Is it working? What? Well, where's this going? And so that kind of ongoing attention, and you know, like with sati sampajanya, mindfulness, and and say full awareness, that that's in a way the, the most important part of it. Rather than okay, we're going to do this, and it is right, and I'm going to make, I, I'm, I, I'm going to defend its rightness. That's relating to a decision from self-view or just control, like being a control freak. More helpful is okay. Well, this looks like a good way forward. Yeah, I feel confident that we got we're making a good decision here. Let's try this and see what happens. So then, if if the effects are good and are beneficial, uh, and you see okay that that's having a good result. Okay, keep going in that direction. If it's uh, if it's not going in a good direction, if there's problems that come from it, then you're okay. Right, we'll learn from that. And make a different choice. So there's also there's uh, there's a difference between being cautious and being anxious. You can see the difference. So that be like standing at the side of a road and waiting for the for the the traffic to to clear before you try and cross is 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 being cautious. It's it's wisdom. <laughs> just getting to the side of a road and just. Uh, Going straight across and, uh, uh, and uh, hoping that the, the cars are not going to hit you is foolishness. You you are cautious. You wait. You look. You look, and then you cross when it looks clear. So that's that's you're using caution because you know there's danger. You're not necessarily afraid, but you're not being stupid. So, uh, and I feel that say particularly like dealing with the coronavirus, it's important to be cautious. But without that feeding anxiety, and that's really <clears throat> down to how um, how we work with our minds moment by moment, and that uh, and I feel it's it's very sensible <laughs> to be cautious. And a lot of the, of the Vinaya discipline is exactly around caution. Don't put yourself in situations that are going to going to be difficult. Don't make trouble for yourself or other people. Don't you know, say. Uh, create the conditions that are then going to be really hard for you to to work with or going to cause damage so wise caution is a, a a powerful ethic in our life and if that drifts into being con constantly anxious or filled with doubt or being upset then the mind is relating to that in, in an unskillful way so say for example when i was a, a, a an agarika and a, a novice at Wat Pananachat, you could hear the big guns going across the rip from Laos all the time. The kind of the uh, that was a, a very kind of ordinary daily presence in our in our life in the monastery. You could hear the big guns uh, blasting away on a daily basis. Um, we were about eighty kilometers away from the Mekong River, and so it was considered okay. That's and you got the river between you. Okay, that's. Yeah, you can hear the guns, and it's it's nineteen seventy eight. So, um, as far as we could tell, it's not too dangerous at the moment. But the the branch monastery Pudindang down near the Cambodian border, um, then Lumpur Cha wouldn't send the foreigners there. He said no, it's uh, it, it's it's okay for the the Thai Sangha because they're, they're local; they speak the language. If we put foreigners there. They're like it's likely to word will spread. There are these foreigners, and and you could get yourselves kidnapped or or or, or harmed. The the insurgency can come across the border. So you're asking for trouble. So Lumpur and, and Pudin Dang was, to be honest, it was an attractive place because they had really good food. <laughs> the uh, Din Dang means red earth, 
and it, and there, it's this particular kind of very fertile soil. So they had really good vegetables at Pudindang. So there was a certain sort of, Lumpo, I'd like to go and practice at Pudindang. <laughs> So, that, you know, really kind of fantastic pumpkins and sweet corn and green beans and whatnot. And so, but Lumpur wouldn't let the Farangs go there because it was a land border. Whereas, the, the, um, and it was, it was very close to, to Cambodia. And, uh, uh, and so that, uh, that was asking for trouble. So he said, no, this, this isn't a good time to go there. Um, you know, the, 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 uh, the uh, war was still raging, and then you had the the Vietnamese came into Cambodia in seventy nine. During the Vassar of nineteen seventy nine, the the Vietnamese came in and and deposed uh, Khmer Rouge. So it was really a very very kind of hot war area. So you know, Lumpur Cha he was cautious. You know, he wouldn't he wouldn't say, "Oh, just you know, go and trust in the Dhamma. You know, chant some parishas and you'll be fine." <laughs> He he wouldn't say that. He's like no. That he could he could uh, from what he understood of the situation and and how unusual it would be to have any foreigners there, and how and he knowing how quickly word spreads around, um, you know, when the, there's there's uh, westerners about in the sort of rural northeast Thailand. He said no. It's asking for trouble. You, you, and it would make it troublesome for for you. Make it troublesome for the other people in the monastery. Also, you're. Uh, you're say putting uh, like a uh, you're cre- helping to create a situation where then would create bad karma for the people who are attacking you or would wanted to kidnap you. That you're you're making it very tempting for them to to create more bad karma for themselves. So uh, he would uh, would not support that. So that uh, making informed choices, you know, you're, you're weighing up a situation. And you 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 go with it. Well, like for myself, you know, in in nineteen eighty seven, eighty six, eighty seven, I went to Northern Ireland uh, a few times in the middle of the, the troubles. Um, the, um, one of the first time, I think the the very first time I went, there had been a, um, a, a the funeral for an IRA uh, operative, uh, a member for which is the the. Repub- the, the Republican uh, sort of Catholic extremists. Uh, it was a, a funeral for an IRA operative, a guy from the Protestant paramilitaries uh, in, um, attacked the funeral and threw grenades at the funeral. And there were people who were killed at the funeral. And that was just a couple of days before I arrived. And so, um, you know, then there it was considered, okay, is it is it safe for you for you to go? Do you want to go? Do you not want to go? What, what's what's the situation? So I decided to go anyway, because um, I thought, well, I'm a Buddhist, and uh, we're outside of that that conflict, and well, let's let's uh, 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 it shouldn't be too much of a trouble. It's too much of a problem, and the people in the Buddhist group in Belfast, they're they're. They are not too uh, alarmed or concerned. They are saying, actually, it would be very, very useful, very good. If you could come, please don't cancel the, the visit. Um, uh, you know, we're, we're sure that you'll be safe. And it was, that was the case. It was, it was fine. It was really interesting for me. As a Buddhist, you're kind of you're almost invisible. It's the one time you're invisible as a Buddhist monk walking down the main street of a town, <laughs> walking down the Falls Road in Belfast. It's like, this is interesting. Like, no one's looking at me. Like because you're obviously not a Protestant or a Catholic, you know you're you're not on one of the 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 the, the main sort of oppositional teams, and so uh, you're not a part of that. And so it was extraordinarily safe. I mean, the, the people in the group were with me, but it was um, a, it was a, a war zone, like with that you know, during the, the the conflict in in the northeast Thai Cambodian Lao area, but. Uh, you know, we weighed up the situation, and it was seemed to be appropriate to step into it, and it was it was very very beneficial, and, and I didn't come to any harm. So you know, you make your choices, and then you see what happens, and and then are informed by by what happens. But uh, being rigid or idealistic is almost always a problem, <laughs> right? And so that. That um, that pattern of 
making a choice and not saying this is the right thing to do, but rather this looks like a good way forward. And I don't know how many times over the years I've, I've, people have asked that, what's the right thing for me to do, Ajahn? You know, what's, what, what's the right thing to do? And I keep saying, there isn't a right thing. Or, or there might be, but it only lasts for a nanosecond, and then something else is the right thing. <laughs> that uh, you, you are, rather than looking for the right thing, then you weigh up the situation, you feel it, you attune to it as well as you can, and then you, and you you get the different inputs from from you know, people as, uh, and assess the situation as well as you can. Then you see what looks like a good way forward. And then you try that and see what happens. And then, then um, what uh, if things go well? It doesn't feed your sense of pride, like hooray! You know, my choice, you know, succeeded, and and uh, this is all good. It's like, well, okay, this is working for the moment. <laughs> this is looking good. Okay, don't make any assumptions, but recognize, yeah, there's there's good feedback from this. It seems to be working. Okay. And you don't take it as an absolute success or absolutely right or something that that is a, 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 and something that's completely positive. You say, okay, well, this looks like a good way forward. Okay, let's just keep going in this way, but be attentive. If it leads to problems or difficulties, then okay, this looks like a, not not a good way forward. What are the alternatives? What what are we learning from this? So the mind relates to success and failure in a completely different way, and it's not personal. So that when things have gone seriously pear-shaped, then you realize, well, that was a mistake. <laughs> and you're not brushing it off or pretending it's not there. You're acknowledging that, you're, you're kind of receiving it, but you're also not, not making it a, a kind of uh, a, a personal crisis, like it's my failure, or I've failed, well, you know, they, they hate me because I've got this all wrong, but rather, okay, well, uh, that's not a good way forward. Let's learn from that, and uh, and make the best use of the problems that have come from this. Then, then, and as I often say, and as most of you have probably heard me say, you know, if you if you think back five or ten years to something that was a real disaster in your life, that was something that you really was like that was that was the worst thing that happened. And it was really terrible, really painful. And then you look at it from the perspective of today, that you would never have chosen that, but actually you, you learned a lot of really useful lessons, a lot of good came from it. And I, I don't know how many times I've asked people to do that little bit, little exercise, and they go, oh, yeah, almost invariably people are going, right, right. And then similarly, if you look back five or 10 years at something, you're thinking, yes, great. I'm so happy about this. And then you look back and think, oh man, I can't, I can't believe I was celebrating. I was, how could I have been so stupid? Why didn't I see what I was getting myself into? But, so what does that say about success and failure? Uh, and uh, so if we really take that kind of approach seriously, then it, it really, I feel it, and my experience is that it, it makes the most uh, beneficial and helpful process of decision making. And that uh, it, uh, that's the best way of, of working with our lives. So on that note, we've gone way past seven o'clock, but I'll leave it there for uh, today.